Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Sanjot Mahendale, and as the chair of the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies, I would like to welcome you to the first lecture in our spring colloquium series. Now, Professor Bencato's talk today will be followed next month on February 25 by the earlier postponed talk on Zoroastrianism in Central Asia. Uh, to be presented on Zoom by Professor Franz Grenet of the Collège de France, Paris. March 4th, hopefully in person, Michael Schenkar, Associate Professor of Pre-Islamic Iranian Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, will deliver the annual Tang Lecture on the History of Sabiana by presenting new evidence from the excavations of uh, Sanjar Shah, a site in northern Tajikistan. Finally, in April, a date and time to be announced, uh, Judith Lerner, research associate at NYU's Institute for the Study of the Ancient World, will be traveling, hopefully, to Berkeley uh, to share her work on the finds from Yihe Nur in fifth, fourth, fifth century Inner Mongolia and their connections to China and Central Asia. Now, you can find information on all of these events on our website. Um, and I very much hope that you'll be joining us at, that, uh, at those later dates. Now, before I get to the speaker today, I just want to go over uh, logistics. If you have technical problems, please use the chat function to alert the web host, Sky von Valkenburg. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll try to get, a, get as many of them answered as time uh, permits. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my departmental colleague, Professor Adam Bencato, Assistant Professor and Bita Daryabari, Presidential Chair of Iranian Studies in the Department of Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures, formerly known as Near Eastern Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Before coming to Berkeley, Professor Bencato spent much of his academic career in Europe, receiving his MA and PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. These were followed by a research appointment in Turfan Studies at the Berlin Brandenburgische Akademie der Wissenschaften and an Alexander von Humboldt Foundation postdoctoral fellowship at the Freie, uh, at Freie Universität, both in Berlin, Germany. He has published extensively on Sogdian materials, including two books uh, in 2018, Studies on the Sogdian Epistolary Tradition. In 2017, uh, Zandname, an edition and literary critical study of the Manichaean Sogdian Parable Book. Among his most recent articles are in 2018 with Christiane Reck, uh, entitled Like a Virgin, a Sogdian Recipe for Restoring Virginity and the Sanskrit Background to Sogdian Medicine. In 2017, Sogdian Letter Fragments from Turfan in the Institute of Oriental Manuscripts, St. Petersburg. Today, he will focus on particular, Sog uh, particular Sogdian mercantile manuscripts from 7th century Turfan. So welcome, Adam. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahendele. It's a pleasure to be here and um, thank you very much for the invitation also to present uh, as part of what sort of might be loosely called now the Tang Center's uh, Year of the Sogdians. Um, and thanks also before I begin to my colleagues, uh, Dr. Jonathan Scaff and Dr. Ching Jialong for discussion of some of the various details of the research which I'll discuss today. So let me just pull up my PowerPoint. Okay, so my goal today is to present some of my research on a unique document. I hope to show how it sheds light on the regionally interconnected nature of Sogdian trade and on the Sogdian involvement in the Silk Road slave trade, and as well to, as, as well to try to elucidate uh, some remaining problems in its interpretation. The Sogdians were a people originating in Central Asia around the Oxus and Sir Darya waterways in what is now mostly the states of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. From their main cities of Bukhara and Samarkand, the Sogdians branched out in antiquity to engage in trade in regions including the northern part of the Indian subcontinent, and most substantially all around the Tarim Basin and beyond well into central and northern China, along what is often though overly simply called the Silk Road. This Sogdian mercantile network flourished around the middle of the first millennium CE, 
and Sogdians established diasporic communities, indeed major settlements in places such as Turfan and Dunhuang, maintaining all the while connections with their compatriots in Sogdiana itself. Sogdians were renowned in Chinese sources of the time as a highly distinctive foreign people with a particular acumen for and activity in long distance trade. But actual mercantile documents in the Sogdian language are not very many, and the ones that exist are therefore very significant. These few texts in Sogdian are as follows. Uh, discovered near Dunhuang were a group of about 10 fragments known as the ancient letters dating to the early 300s CE. These were letters sent by Sogdians in the Dunhuang area back home to Samarkand, indicated on the map in this shaded area of Sogdiana. And these ancient letters um, mention many commodities traded by Sogdians at the time, including gold, silver, camphor, pepper, musk, silk, and other kinds of cloth. From early seventh century Turfan comes a single contract for the sale of the slave, which we'll be talking about later. And from the area of Khotan, about 10 fragments of letters and receipts dating a bit later, possibly even to the ninth century CE and mentioning things like cotton and currency. Other direct evidence in Sogdian comes from two epitaphs left behind by Sogdian merchants resident in central and northern Chinese cities. Uh, that of Shi Jun, also known as Wurkak, and his wife Ryusi, on an elaborate tomb in Xi'an, uh, which we heard about actually from Jin Chu last October. And the epitaph uh, without a tomb attached to it of Nanai Vande and his wife Kei Khan in the Chinese city of Ye. Both of these epitaphs are bilingual in Sogdian and Chinese. But with the exception of a few very small fragments here and there, these, uh, which I've just mentioned, are virtually all the Sogdian language sources. And here are some additional images to give you an idea of what these texts look like, um, the ancient letters. Uh, this is a, a ruined watchtower, I think like the one that the ancient letters were found near, but not the exact one, and some of the epitaphs. However, the Sogdians are mentioned frequently in Chinese sources, including economic and historical texts, registers, and other types of documents. Given the wide range of Sogdian activity, this dearth of original uh, documentation seems perplexing. But on the other hand, the survival of paper documents from 1500 years ago is, it must be admitted, mostly due to accident. The ancient letters were, for example, discovered in an abandoned mail bag in a ruined watchtower preserved by its isolation and the arid desert climate. Looking at uh, Turfan in particular, which can uh, justly be called one of the hubs of the Sogdian trade network, it is the case that what is now known about the Turfan economy and society in the middle of the first millennium CE, including a great deal about the Sogdians, is based almost entirely on Chinese texts and ones which survived by accident at that. For example, in places like the Astana graveyard, just outside the ancient city of Gaocheng, um, in the Turfan oasis, thousands of texts survived simply because people repurposed old paper documents as accessories accompanying burials, like shoes, hats, and other types of decorations. Uh, undisturbed, and likewise, in an arid climate, these tombs preserved not only paper, but also food items and human remains in good condition. And you see here below some of the texts that were sort of cut to make these burial objects um, outside of their having been cut, they're otherwise in quite good condition in general. Uh, like many texts from the Silk Road, whose survival is an accident, these Astana texts do not form a coherent or intentional archive, but some patterns nonetheless exist. As mentioned, for example, these are almost exclusively in Chinese, with the reason for this being that mainly Chinese settlers and inhabitants of Gaocheng were buried there, and they therefore reused Chinese texts to make their burial accessories. One particular tomb is something of an exception to this rule, however, which is tomb 135 which when it was excavated in 1969, was found to contain two uh, fully preserved documents, one in Sogdian and one in Chinese, which were not cut up and repurposed as burial objects, 
but rather carefully rolled up and stored inside the tomb for some reason. The Sogdian text is a contract for the sale of an enslaved woman from a Sogdian merchant to a Chinese monk and was first published uh, in Japanese by Yutaka Yoshida and Takao Moriyasu. The Chinese text, which was found rolled up inside the Sogdian one, was a contract for the sale of land between two Chinese people. It isn't clear as far as I can tell that the tomb itself belonged to any individual mentioned in either of these two texts. And indeed the Sogdian slave contract and the Chinese land contract seem to differ with different, seem to deal with different people entirely. This Sogdian contract, which I'll be calling DP for short, uh, which is sort of an abbreviation of the Sogdian term, thy puste, which appears in the text. So female slave document or contract. Um, this contract is naturally of great interest for a number of reasons. It is the only Sogdian document attesting to Sogdian's involvement in the slave trade in this region. It is one of few Sogdian mercantile texts overall, as I've mentioned. And it's also one of the only Sogdian texts from a period of four, about four centuries between the ancient letters of the early 300s and the Mughu documents uh, from Sogdiana itself in the early 700s. And it is this contract that shall occupy our attention for the remainder of this presentation. So before proceeding to, a dis to discussing some problems of this text, uh, allow me to summarize what it says first. It begins with a dating formula, giving the date according to the regnal year of the ruler of Yaocheng, who was essentially the vassal of the Western Turks, a sort of semi-nomadic grouping of Turkic tribes. Uh, the date is given mostly in Chinese form with a partial Sogdian equivalent and has been calculated to be 639 CE. You'll notice as well that the name of Gaocheng is given in its Sogdian version, Chinanshkan, which means literally Chinese city in reference to the do dominant ethnic group at that time being the Chinese. The contract then states that the monk Yanxian, son of Uta of the Chan clan, bought a slave of the Chuyak clan born in Turkestan named Upach from Wachjvyat, son of Tuvak, from Samarkand for the price of 120 Persian dirhams. It continues with some contractual information. Yansian's purchase belongs to his descendants as well, and, he is, and his descendants may treat their possession however they wish. The contract is valid concerning all people, and whoever holds the document also possesses the slave. And finally, the, the contract is wit witnessed by four other Sogdians, written by a Sogdian scribe, uh, certified by the chief scribe of Gaochang at the request of Wachshviat and with the consent of Upach. And we'll talk about some of these formulations in just a minute. Uh, and then it's signed off on by the chief scribe of Gaochang, which is in that sort of separate line in the middle you see at the bottom of the text. The mark following that last line of text indicates that no more text is to be added after that point. And then one line on the back of the document seems to indicate that this was Yan Xian's copy of the official version. This contract is one of a number of slave sale contracts in multiple languages from the quote unquote Silk Road over the span of the first millennium CE several of which involve Sogdians as the buyers or sellers, but it is the only one in the Sogdian language so far known, as I've said. Composed just before the fall of the Gaocheng kingdom to the Tang Empire in 640 CE, this uh, text, DP, uh, gives a glimpse of Turfan society at this time. It attests not only to the presence of Sogdians from all over, which we'll talk about shortly and which is also supported by copious Chinese evidence, but is also one of the only documents implying the existence of a kind of central market in Gaochang, one supervised by an actual official and one in which seemingly Sogdian, not just Chinese documents had a kind of legal power. There are two themes or topics where I think um, the further study of this particular text can contribute to our understanding of how the Sogdians were integrated into the larger structures of trade, and in particular, the slave trade in this region. And these are one, uh, how the contract fits into a sort of regional legal tradition and uh, to the backgrounds of the people mentioned in it. 
uh, about 10 years ago, uh, noticing a number of parallels in phrasing and, contact and content between contracts in languages such as Prakrit, Khotanese, Tumshukis, Uyghur, and Bactrian, uh, discovered at a variety of sites in the Tarim region, with the exception of Turfan. Uh, Doug Hitch argued that these contracts represented various outcomes of one and the same legal tradition. In particular, Hitch suggested that as the Kushans, who were uh, a kingdom from Bactria, so on this map here, somewhat to the south of Samarkand, it's not totally on the map. Um, as the Kushans controlled large swaths of the Terran Basin in the second century CE, all these contracts in different languages went back to a Kushan legal tradition. Uh, building on this work more recently, uh, Shen Wen showed that the contracts from this region in these different languages, in fact, have a shared overall structure uh, in seven parts as follows. So the first part contains the date of the contract. The second part gives the information about the parties involved in the transaction. Then there's the price of the good or the enslaved person, the rights of the new owner of the property, a penalty clause, um, certification of the witnesses and scribes, and then a clause about how the physical document is to be treated or preserved. Interestingly, uh, the Sogdian contract DP is largely parallel, despite being from Turfan, which Hitch thought to be accepted from this Kushan legal heritage. Um, so DP is parallel, but it does differ in a few ways. So it would, as you see here, the sections occur more or less in common with the exception of the Sogdian or with the DP contract in particular, not having a penalty clause, instead having a validity clause, and also not having any language about the physical treatment of the document, but having a kind of official uh, mark of the scribe, right? So uh, this is just the Sogdian contract DP. Um, on the other hand, this is the only Sog Sogdian contract from the entire region. So uh, sort of our conclusions about whether or not it conforms or um, does not conform to a Kushan legal tradition uh, can only be tentative until further Sogdian contracts in the region are discovered, which I hope obviously will be the case. So one of Hitch's original arguments was about the existence of this penalty clause. So this is what he used to connect the contracts in all these different languages. Um, this penalty clause indicated that whoever violated the terms of the contract would owe a debt to, a, to an authoritative body of some sort, but they would also be subjected to corporal punishment such as lashes or beating with a stick. Um, this clause can be found in contracts in Bactrian, Prakrit, Kotanese, and Tumshukis, but not in uh, Sagrian contract DP, which in its place has a validity clause whereby the contract acquires the function of a deed or voucher uh, endowing whoever possesses the document itself with ownership of the person or property purchased in the original transaction, and also has some language about the contract being valid for all people. Um, the language of DP puts it this way, uh, quote, this slave contract is in force concerning all people, king or minister. He who bears and possesses this slave contract should receive this slave upach and lead and possess her as a slave. DP also has uh, an interesting sixth clause, uh, which not only includes mention of the uh, witnesses, oops, sorry, skipping ahead. So uh, DP also has this, this rights clause. So this uh, section four of this shared sort of structure, the rights of the new owner, it shares its uh, rights clause with Bactrian and Prakrit documents. And this rights clause gives the buyer and their descendants a sort of uh, eternal possession of whatever was purchased and it also gives them the power to treat the person or property however they wish, including with violence. DP uh, puts it this way. So this is again from the Sogdian contract, quote, thus Yan Sian the monk himself, as well as his sons, grandsons, family, and descendants may at will hit, abuse, or bind her, sell, or pledge her, provide, or offer her as a gift, and do all that they might wish to do to her. So it gives a, a rather uh, broad freedom for abuse and for further transactions. Um, DP also has an interesting sixth clause, which not only includes mention of the witnesses and the scribes who wrote and signed off on the text, 
but also includes two additional phrases. Uh, one is that the seller, uh, the guy named Wachschwert, not the buyer, requested the document. And the other is the curious statement that it was made with the consent, consent of Upach, who was the enslaved woman. The inclusion of a note about who requested this document also in, uh, occurs in the Prakrit corpus, but the part about the enslaved person's consent is rather unexpected. Perhaps it simply meant that she agreed for another copy of the document to be made, but one also can't imagine her having much of a choice in any of these matters. It has been suggested that this part may be derived from a Chinese legal tradition at the time, but I haven't seen any parallels for this yet, and so I'm not sure if this is to be assumed or not. These aspects of the contract's uh, formulations and structure, and there are others that could be discussed as well, raise a number of questions. Did Sogdian contracts in general used by merchants in this area conform to the regional inherited Kushan tradition? Or did they represent their own local development from Sogdian contracts used back home in Sogdiana? Were contracts in the Sogdian language, such as this valid for Chinese authorities? Or was this copy made just as a backup or for some other function just for the buyers or sellers in records? So I think I'll skip talking about the coins and the scribal mark for now, but we can always come back to them. Um, so with the questions that I asked, um, stewing in your minds, I'd like to turn to my second area of inquiry for today, which is the people mentioned in this contract and their origins. To resume, the contract names three people directly involved in this transaction. Wachsbjart, uh, the seller, Monk Yansian, the buyer, and Upach, the enslaved woman. Moreover, there are four people named as witnesses, and then there are two scribes responsible for the production and certification of the document. Uh, some of these people present no difficulties of interpretation. For example, the seller, Wachsbjart, son of Tudak, a Samarkandian, is quite clearly a Sogdian, as indicated both by his name and his Samarkandian origin. It is also clear that Wachsbjart has gathered his compatriots as witnesses to the transaction. All of the names and origins listed for the witnesses are Sogdian, including another Samarkandian. So there's a guy named Tishrat, son of Chuzak, a Maimurian, so from the area around Panjikent, east of Samarkand. Someone named Namvar, son of Kotawich, the, the second person from Samarkand, besides the seller. Pesak, son of Kaz, a Nuchkantian, and this is, uh, there are multiple settlements by this name, so it could be from somewhere in Sogdiana or a little bit further to the east. And finally, the fourth witness is Nizat, son of Nanai Kuch, a Kushanian, so from the town Kushania between uh, Samarkand and Bukhara. Um, but the identities of the, the buyer and the enslaved woman are a little thornier to interpret. The buyer, Monk Yansian, son of Uta of the Chan clan, was linked by Yutaka Yoshida in a later study with a person mentioned in other Tuofan documents in Chinese named Zhang Yansian. On a purely linguistic level, the Sogdian can be accepted as a transcription of the Chinese, as it corresponds quite closely to the reconstructed early Middle Chinese forms, which would be the stage of the Chinese language uh, spoken at this time. So this character, Zhang Yanxiang, occurs in some other of these uh, Turfan uh, Chinese fragments from the Astana graveyard. So is a person that was around in Turfan at this time. But anyways, that's the proposal. Um, but at the, at the same time, the, the father's name, Uta, doesn't appear to be Sogdian or Chinese. And so there's still a question out there about Yansian's origin and whether there might be more to say about him. But another, uh, perhaps more obvious question arises, which is why did a Buddhist monk purchase a slave? Um, in a recent study of slavery in the Tufan area, Jonathan Scaff has suggested that Yansian was a particular type of monk, a Baixing Sing, a monk who was not celibate and owned property. This explanation finds support in some other contemporary cases. Scaff notes, for example, that documents show monasteries, small and large, uh, in the Gaochang area to have owned slaves, as did monasteries in Dunhuang and elsewhere in the Tang Empire. 
if Yan Xian was indeed a peasant monk of this kind, perhaps this would also explain why he does not seem to have a Chinese Buddhist name. And if the tomb was his, why he was embalmed and entombed rather than cremated. Uh, and it's also worth uh, mentioning that the name of the buyer in the Chinese contract, which was found together with the Sogdian contract in tomb 135, uh, is totally different and is much harder to reconcile with the Sogdian form. And so the connection between these two documents remains a mystery. The identity of Upach, the enslaved woman of the contract, however, has been misunderstood previously. Uh, drawing on Yoshida's original edition of the text, most studies of Turfan and Silk Road economic activity have understood her to be a Sogdian. But I don't think this can be supported by the text. The phrase given the information about her reads, uh, quote, a female slave of the Chuyak clan born in Turkestan named Upach. Though previous studies have considered Chuyak to be the surname of Upach, I argue that this is not reflected in the Sogdian, which as a convention always puts a family name or patronymic after the given name, as can be seen just by looking at the other names in this contract. Moreover, Sogdians typically did not use surnames, instead being identified by their place of origin, as you've seen with the names of, of the Sogdians in this contract. So here, even though the word kotur, which means clan, is used, and you can see it in, used to talk about the clan of Yansian the monk. So even though this word is used uh, in, the, in the phrase describing upach, uh, it is used as part of an adjective, chuyak koturanch, meaning of or pertaining to the chuyak clan. So this is a feminine adjective modifying the word thy, which means a female slave. Um, or a female servant, and then the masculine equivalent would be Vandak. So the text then indicates that she was born in Turkestan, and at the very end, it sort of adds in her given name, Upach, almost as an afterthought. This phrasing, therefore, foregrounds the information most relevant from a contractual point of view that the enslaved person was associated with the Chuyak clan. So I would say it cannot be stated on the basis of the text that Upach either had the last name Chuyak nor that she was Sogdian. But the text does indicate that there was a female slave associated in some way with a Chuyak clan, perhaps in their possession up until the point of the sale or obtained from them. But this Chuyak clan has not yet been identified. Looking more broadly, however, at the historical context of early seventh century, Turfan provides some intriguing possibilities. Sources of Tang history in Chinese, such as the old new Tang histories, mention that in 638 CE, the year before the contract was drawn up, the Western Turk Chu Yue and Chu Mi tribes allied with Gao Chang to sack five cities or sack some cities in the area of Karasha, which is uh, another settlement in the Tufan, in the Tarim region, about 200 kilometers to the west of Tufan. And this Western Turk uh, Gao Chang alliance took 1500 men and women captured um, as slaves. So at this time, Gao Chang was essentially a tributary state of the Western Turks with a local ruler installed by them. Uh, this was the El Tiber king that was mentioned, for example, uh, in the dating formula of the contract. And the Western Turks probably compelled Gao Chang to attack, to attack Karashah with them, uh, seemingly as retribution uh, for that area, for Karashah trying to establish separate trade routes uh, to the Tang Empire rather than through Turfan, which was kind of a, in some ways a bottleneck of trade controlled by the Western Turks. Um, and so it seems that Karasha had tried to go around the Western Turks and Gaochan and make their own connections with the Tang Empire. Uh, and then the Tang Empire was to conquer the Turfan area anyways in 640 CE, which is one year after the contract was drawn up. So because of the historical context, it is tempting to compare the Chuyue who sacked Karasha and enslaved some people with the Chuyak of our contract. But in order to make a linguistic identification, we would need to compare the early middle Chinese reconstructed form of their name with the Sagin form as it is in the contract DP. So as you can see, this comparison is close, but not exact. One potential difficulty, of course, is that we have no other uh, Sagdian texts from the time, 
so we cannot see how Chinese might have been transcribed into Sogdian more generally. Later texts, such as Buddhist ones from a Turfan about a century later, do have transcriptions of Chinese into Sogdian, but their system has a number of pe peculiarities, and besides, it would probably represent a somewhat different and standardized style of Chinese to Sogdian transcription in a learned Buddhist environment, which is not the environment of this contract. So while the Chuyue Chuyak identification is promising but not yet convincing on a linguistic level, the historical context is to me compelling. We might also look to analyze the name Upach for information on its origin. If it is accepted that Upach was among those enslaved in Karashah by the Turk Yaochang Alliance, then we might expect her name to be Tukarian. It has been suggested that Upach could be one of a group of names localizable to the area around Karashah, but not actually of Tukarian origin. But as the contract specifies her to have been born in Turkestan, her name might have another, but as yet unidentified origin, though it is not discernibly Sagdi in Chinese or Turkic. In any case, of course, uh, personal names in general may not provide very strong evidence for ethnic or linguistic origin, and of course, the place where a person was born may not correspond to the place where they later lived and potentially were captured and enslaved. Uh, so much for the dramatis uh, personae of this text. And I think at this point, you have all earned a few concluding, uh, though probably not conclusive remarks. So to summarize, a possible historical scenario for this contract is the following. During the 638 uh, CE sack of Karashar, the Chuyue captured and enslaved Upach and uh, 1,499 others. Uh, Gaochang being a major trade hub and seat of the Chuyue's allies was a logical destination as a slave market. And indeed the Turfan area, according to the extant documentation, was experiencing at this time what Valerie Hansen has called a massive esca escalation in the volume of the slave trade. Given the Sogdians' participation in, the trade, in that trade in this region and their significant presence in Turfan generally, it isn't surprising that a Sogdian merchant could have brokered the sale of an enslaved person, perhaps buying her and others from the Chuyue captors and selling them on for a profit. If this scenario is valid, it may point to a potential source of the Sogdians' involvement in the slave trade, as Chinese laws seem to have prohibited the enslavement of free, presumably Chinese people, and at least back home in Sogdiana, uh, Sogdians were not to be enslaved either, the Sogdians could take advantage of conflict in this larger region to acquire previously captured foreign slaves and sell them legally. From the textual side of things, DP also shows a number of interesting features. In its overall structure, it accords in some details with the proposed Kushan style of contract, but in other details, like its use of a Chinese date, the scribal practices and the use of Persian dirhams, it shows a uh, particularly, shall we say, Gaochangian or Trofanian flavor. And in some other small details, it seems to be linked, as one might also expect, with Sogdian documents from back home in Sogdiana. So if Sogdian contracts were not originally part of the Kushan legal heritage in the region, in the Sogdian diaspora as represented in the Gaochang kingdom, they seem to have been partially integrated, it, into, integrated into it in order to conform with local norms. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I would be more than happy to answer questions with the time remaining. So thank you, Adam, for uh, this linguistic deep dive into, you know, one of uh, the, the, the Sogdian or one of the few sort of Sogdian manuscripts and helping, you know, sort of or um, wrap our, our minds around how you would read such a document and how you actually can can come to to understand it. Um, there are a few questions, but I, I'm just wondering if you compare this document um, with the documents in the other languages, which I'm not sure, you know, you've done a, a kind of broader sort of comparative uh, analysis. Um, I'm just thinking she was like a, a, it's like a householder slave, right? I mean, she went to probably be in, in his household, whoever this monk uh, was. Um, do you get a sense of, of 
um, the the destination, or, or is there something more to say about sort of the origins uh, of um, the the slaves that that were traded sort of in this in this area, and um, anything more specific about you know who were the ones on on either end? Uh, were the Sardians very much involved, or was this something that everybody kind of in power or econo economic or political power was involved with or um and were there particular groups who who made up perhaps the the bulk of the of the slaves so i'm just wondering in broader context uh what you would say about where this fits yeah that's a great question um so i'll try to i'll try to sh to say what i can about some of the matter so uh, beginning with the contract itself um Outside, outside of this single document, we don't have any other information about the fate of Upaj or the fate of Yansian. Um, so if the suggestion about Yansian being a kind of uh, peasant monk is, is correct, then uh, any potential enslaved people might have been used to cultivate his lands or do something like that. Um, and as for uh, the characteristics of slaves in the region uh, more generally from what I, it, it really varies. So it, so from Chinese sources, it can be seen that Sogdians were an active participant in the slave trade in general, not just in Turfan. Um, in some Chinese uh, contracts attesting to the slave trade from Turfan, there seem to be Sogdians definitely involved in the transaction as buyers or sellers but the identities of the slaves is sort of disputed. So it has been suggested that some of the slaves were Sogdian origin, mm -hmm. um, but in, in, in other cases, they seem to have been given various kinds of names or nicknames and have a sort of generic foreign origin. So perhaps it's a sort of from Central Asia somewhere, perhaps even right. in various kinds of Turkic people. Um, in some of these other slave contracts from the region, like in Prakrit, or other languages, the enslaved people have names, like say in the Prakrit context, contracts, they have some Prakrit names. So they seem to have either been given a local name or to have actually been somebody belonging to that ethnic group or society. So it's still a little bit unclear, in, say what the source of, of slaves in this region might have been in general. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just one more, and then I'm going to go to the the, the question. And in, in terms of the the positioning, that monk, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, where does he sort of fit into uh, broader, uh, uh, you know, positions of of monks? Are we talking in the Buddhist context? What are we talking? You know, are we talking in in some other context? Is there is there any sort of well, anything so else think... known? Yeah, so I think the operating assumption is that um, he is Buddhist because of two factors. One is the use of this of the term monk in the Sogdian, which seems, uh -huh. uh, as far as I can tell, only be used in reference to to Buddhist monks so far. And then the the Chinese name. So the assumption being that most of the Chinese people in Turkmen at the time would have been Buddhist. And of course, that's amply documented in other texts and in what's been discovered archeologically. Yeah. Um, and then, as I mentioned, and, and there's, there's various Chinese texts attesting to the presence of kind of these smaller scale, well, smaller monasteries for one, and are, there's been the discovery of the ruins of monasteries, but also mention of these kinds of peasant monk figures cultivating sort of smaller plots of land and that kind of thing. Right. So, the, of course, the contract doesn't say anything explicit about yeah. Buddhism, but just on this larger context, it's assumed to fit in. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go to a couple of uh, questions. How widespread was the practice of slaveholding and trading amongst the Sogdians? Also, how much do we know about the legal system undergirding the slave contract under examination here? Yeah. Well, so yeah, about the Sogdians, I think I answered that a little bit as much as I could, but um, the, the Chinese sources in general, not just from Turofan, attest to 
as I would say, probably if you were if you were to sort of extrapolate a little bit, then throughout this Sogdian uh, network in the the Tarim region and central China, the Sogdians were involved in transacting slaves. Um, at what quantity is kind of not necessarily discernible yet, um, as far as I know, but it's definitely along with the sort of trade in, in other commodities um, like silk and, and other textiles and so forth, um, slaves seem to have simply been part of that. Um, so about the legal system, yeah, well, it's, it's a difficult question because we only have this contract to represent the Sogdian side of things. And then there are various uh, Chinese contracts representing a sort of Chinese side of things, um, all from this Astana uh, graveyard. Um, so it's a bit hard to say what the legal system in general was. Uh, we just have to extrapolate on the basis of what's in the text themselves. Um, but you know, for looking at DP, you can see, for example, that there is a series of officials. So there's a there's a, a there's a chief scribe of Gao Cheng. So this person presumably has some kind of wider authority. There is this allusion to um, a central market in Gao Cheng. So you can kind of try to imagine the institutions that would have been there to support it. And then, of course, you know, this document had to have some kind of validity. Um, and and more generally, the, the authorities in Gaocheng kept all sorts of records. So there was sort of um, entry and exit type records. There's other documents um, relating to the transaction and sale of, of goods rather than enslaved people. And so you can kind of reconstruct what the larger situation might have been, but um, it's all on the basis of kind of various fragmentary documents. Mm -hmm. I hope that kind of answers the question. And then, um, yeah, it was sort of feeding off what I already, I think, asked. What clues tells us that the book that the monk was Buddhist? What clues tell us that the monk was Buddhist? That's another question that was in the box. Right. So just those, just those things that I mentioned yeah. in the sort of general context, content, context of uh, Chinese, the Chinese population of Gaocheng at the time. And then this word that's used in the contract meaning monk. Mm -hmm. um, and at this early date, I mean, it's not necessarily, I think this date is a little bit too early for the existence of the Christian and Manichaean communities in Turfan. Um, and so this person being a Christian or, or Manichaean monk uh, mm -hmm. is out of the question, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there are no more questions in the Q&A. Uh, I had just one more in, ter in terms of positioning this document. So you said between the ancient, uh, time-wise, it's sort of ancient letters, then a lot of nothing, then you have these, the few examples, and then uh, you have Mount Mu. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, is this contract pulled towards Mount Mu in any way? Um, not because it's it's about slave, but in terms of its Mm -hmm. its content and its and its form uh, or do, is it a contract that sort of floats in this area or or, or um yeah absolutely um ferments yeah, in this area yeah definitely yeah so the the muku documents it is is pretty much the only corpus of documents found in Sogdiana itself and is kind of for those who don't already know is kind of the archive or part of the archive of the last king of Sogdiana before the Arab conquest and in that corpus of documents are uh, three or four um, contracts. So mm -hmm. two of them are wedding contracts and two are, are for the sale, are sale contracts. So yes, the, 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 some of the formulaic language there aligns with that of DP. And so there is definitely a link with the Sogdian tradition generally. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, there aren't any contracts for the sale of slaves from the MOOC archive, um, but we can definitely say that, that DP goes back to Sogdiana in, in some of its formulations. Yeah. yeah, I want to apologize because I was in the chat box because that's where people started to post their questions and then I forgot to monitor the Q the actual Q&A box. So there are actually more questions. So if you have time, I just want to... Yeah, um, it seemed that there's some people wanting to... a few comments on the coins. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Matthew uh, on uh, uh, posted this question: Were Persian dirhams used as main currency throughout the Tarim Basin? Do those coins end up in Chang'an, and do Abbasid coins eventually take over? Yeah. So maybe I'll just pull up my slide for this. Actually, um, so again, uh, in this case, uh, Jonathan Scaff has written the, the book uh, or the article on uh, coins. In, in Turfan, so I encourage you to, to look that up if any of you are more interested in this topic. Uh, more or less, there are a number of basically Sasanian and what are called Arab Sasanian, so early Arab Islamic coins that were on the Sasanian model uh, found in Turfan and mentioned in Turfan texts. So, and then these coins, I think, range from being from the early 300s so under the reign of Shakur II, all the way to the late 600s, and these would be the Arab Sasanian um, silver coins. And part of the reason, so I guess there's sort of two reasons for their predominance. One would be that there's this sort of flow of commodities westward uh, into Central Asia and beyond, and then sort of in, in exchange a flow of uh, currency into the east, uh, into the Turfan area and, and other places. And another one is that these were uh, very high quality silver coins, so being almost pure silver, and so were, were valued for not being debased or mixed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a, basically a ton of, of Sasanian and Arab Sasanian silver coins that were found in Turfan. Um, this contract in particular mentions 120 dirhams or drachms as being the, the price for the sale of Ukach and appends this interesting word Persian minted. So it's specifying not just local silver coins, not Central Asian silver coins, but uh, Sasanian silver coins. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard to tell if 120 was a lot or, or a little. Um, so I think there's a Chinese contract in the same area dated just a little bit before that gives the price for the sale of a, of a slave as 380 coins, but I don't think it specifies silver or Persian or anything like that. Um, so this is actually quite a common phenomenon at tour funds. It's not surprising at all that the, the transaction involved silver coins, particularly Persian ones. Um, then there's a question, anything to the name, a single quote slave name, what does it mean, if anything? Yeah, I mean, maybe not a lot, right? So uh, I think if, if, if some of the Chinese sources are any indication, then these enslaved people received kinds of random names almost, or um, okay. names that designated physical characteristics. Um, so it might not mean anything, um, or it could just be a kind of word in a local language, meaning something like, I don't know, woman or slave or anything. Um, so it might really not tell us that much about her origin, which is instead, at least for the contractual purposes, what's relevant is that she's born in Turkestan and is associated with this Chuyak clan. Um, and so I think, you know, from a contractual point of view, the contract doesn't really care that this person has a given name or not. They care about where they've come from and how, they, how they're being handled, right? Right. So in the end, yeah, it might not actually be a very strong argument for anything one way or another. Um, next question. Given that the contract acted as a deed, why would it be buried? Why not give it to heirs as it gave them rights? Was Upach dead? Had she been a person of status? That's a great question, and I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, from the excavation reports, what I can tell is that the, this particular tomb was relatively um, relatively empty compared to some of the other tombs. So it, I don't know if that means that it was, you know, hit by grave robbers already. Um, I think that there was a embalmed body in it and the reports just say that there are very few of these sort of paper decorations. I think there was only one other fragment which was used as like a paper decoration and then these two perfectly preserved texts. So it's kind of a mystery. I mean, why would that person bring it with them? Why would it be, you know, preserved uh, in this way in this tomb? I don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, 
I noticed the term, quote, Turkestan appeared in this document. I wonder, does this term also appear in any other early Sogdian documents besides the ones collected from uh, Hotan in 2015? Is there any clue for us to find out how Sogdians define it geographically? Yeah, Turkestan is also a different, uh, a difficult term, unfortunately. It's not actually mentioned very many times in Sogdian sources. I think it maybe it occurs two other times and both of those are from much later. So one of them is in, the, is in these Koten letters, which I mentioned briefly. Um, and there it contrasts the term Turkestan with the term more or less Uyghuristan or where the Uyghurs are. So there seems to, for the Sogdians writing in like ninth century Khotan, there seems to have been a difference between Turkestan and the Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. um, I think Yoshida simply said that Turkestan is basically all of this Northern steppe region, you know, kind of North of the Tian Shan mountains above Turfan, which is a huge area. It could be anything. So born in Turkestan in that case is a very imprecise term. Um, and then I think that there's maybe one other use of it in the Manichaean texts from, you know, like ninth or 10th century to a point. So it's also a little bit difficult to figure out what that meant for Sogdians. Um, but, it, you know, it might be that the perspective isn't necessarily a Sogdian perspective, but like the Gaochang perspective. So for somebody, for a document that had authority in Gaochang, maybe Turkestan meant, you know, the domains of right. the West Turks in general. Um, so you're, you're, you know, everyone is asking like the hard questions about <laughs> there are a few yeah. answers from this document. Yeah. You know, part of the difficulty is that there aren't comparable documents right. in Sogdian, right? Yeah. Um, could you bring up again what the Sogdian word for monk is used in the text? Was this term ever used for Christian or Manichaean persons? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, let me... I hope I have it here. Yes, so it's um, in Sogdian, it's Shemini, which um, is which should be a, a, a loan word from Shramana, right? The Indic or Sanskrit term for monk. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I think it might be used in the Christian and Manichaean texts, um, but those, but at least the Manichaean ones prefer to talk about the individuals by their specific position within the Manichaean hierarchy or describe them as like hearers or elect. Um, so monk is maybe a bit of an imprecise term for the Manichaeans. Um, but at any rate, I think in Turfan, this is a little too early for that to really mean a Manichaean or Christian mm -hmm. monk in Turfan. I was also struck by the consent of the woman and wondered if she cons is consenting to being bought or being sold. Could one imagine that the seller was prevented from selling her without cons consent from another contract? Yeah, that's um, a bit of a strange phrase for a contract for the sale of an enslaved person. Um, and I, I don't really know what it could mean. I mean, maybe it is about referring to another contract. Um, and I think it has been suggested that this is like a parallel from a Chinese legal tradition, but I actually haven't been able to find any parallels for that yet. So. Um, I don't really know what it should what it should mean. Um, it doesn't really make much sense that this person, I mean, that would kind of defeat the notion of them being bought and sold if they sort of consented to it. But you know, maybe if we if we knew more about the how this functioned in Gaochang, we could elucidate that. I wonder. I wondered if you had any further comments. What the physical treatment of the document entailed. Secondly, any comment, comments regarding the points, and you did that just now, so yeah. regarding the physical treatment. Right, about the physical treatment. Um, let me, uh, okay. So, right, this occurs in contracts in other languages, uh, basically saying that this document should not be torn up, it shouldn't be modified, um, and, you know, there's a penalty for that, basically. Um, and that's all there is to it. Like a passport. Sure, yeah. Right, it, right. yeah. Um, dear Adam, thank you a lot for this interesting comparative look on the document. It is the more interesting since the Pahlavi Hazard d'Adestan has been written nearly at the same time as the DP. Do you think that this was really a large scale of tr slave trade, maybe in the context of war, capturing, as you mentioned, or could we also think of a private debt uh, bondage as a source of slavery? 
Mm -hmm. uh, another remark in the MHD, so the, the Pahlavi uh, document, the price of an adult slave is 200 dirham. Mm -hmm. Are there remarkable differences in the documents? Yeah. Um, as far as I know, the, there are not major parallels, um, sort of in terms of the structure and formulation of these two documents. Um, but I need to revisit that. Um, I don't know if there was, I don't, I don't know how to describe the scale of the slave trade in the region. Um, so let me first refer you to Jonathan Scaff's paper on sort of slavery and foreign slaves at Turfan, which has appeared recently. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, on the other hand, if you know, one raid of Qadr Shah resulted in 1500 slaves, uh, or captured and enslaved people, that seems like it's fairly significant. Um, and then as for the, the question about private debt bondage as a form of slavery, I think the answer is yes. So one could be certainly a source of captive, captives being a source of, of slaves in the region. Um, another, um, I think debt bondage is, is certainly suggested by other Sogdian documents like the ancient letters, the, the possibility of sort of falling into debt bondage. So um, I suppose this is also a potential for the background of Upach, of debt bondage. Um, yes, in other words. And then could you go into more detail into the mechanics of contract enforcement in Gaochang at the time? Yeah. Um, so I have to admit to not really being an expert in, in, in Gaochang yet. Um, so I, I don't really know yet, but I think we also don't know a great deal about the legal system of Gaochang and, you know, say outside of, of what's indicated by this contract, what the system would require from somebody who had a contract or who held a slave or something like that. Um, so yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't know too much about that yet. Mm -hmm. uh, could there be any prohibition for a monk to purchase a slave in Gaochang at the time? Could this be the reason why the contract was drawn up in Sogdian? Right, that's a good question. So, I mean, potentially, yes, I suppose it, it could be weird for somebody that was say a, a normative type of Buddhist monk to want to be purchasing a slave um, and so maybe that's an intriguing suggestion as to like why it was drawn up in Sogdian instead of in Chinese. Um, it does seem that this is a copy. Um, this, is, this is the monk's copy in Sogdian. So there is that discrepancy as so if the monk is a Chinese Buddhist, why does he have a Sogdian contract? Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you know, it might be the case, certainly in the Chinese legal tradition, um, up until that point, I think it was standard to have two copies of the contract. And so there might, have, what the other, copy of this contract, you know, one wonders if that was in Chinese or also in Sogdian. Um, and then again, this larger question of, okay, would a Sogdian contract have validity in, really have a validity in Gaochang? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I think there's one more left. Um, I think Kadir uses the term shaman to refer to Buddhists as well. Yeah, shramana, so this, the Middle Persian version of, uh, of Shamana, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I think those were all the questions and actually this worked out great, you know, to have a slightly shorter talk and then accommodate a lot of the, the, the questions and have uh, sort of a, a, a discussion after. So thank you very much, Adam, for taking the thank time you. and sharing uh, your work on this wonderful sort of manuscript and, um, I look forward to uh, hearing more about it in, in the future if you're going to continue. On no, your well, thanks very much for inviting me and thanks everyone for your questions and for your attention. And yeah, thank you to your audience. Thank you to Frank uh, B.A. and Sky from Falkenberg for uh, doing everything behind the scenes. And uh, I look forward to um, you joining us uh, at our next event. So thank you very much. Have a good day and a good weekend.